and praise the Lord. Welcome to our Sunday service, this fifth day of July 2020. Uh, I want to welcome all of you at home, watching us this morning, uh, Phil at Jesus' feet. I'd like us to begin by just going through Psalm 146. Psalm 146. Uh, people have called this a hallelujah psalm. It's a psalm of praise. Psalm 146, I will read. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. What a timely reminder for us this morning to put our trust in the Lord. He alone is the place we should put our trust. Where have you put your trust this morning? Are you trusting in princes? Are you trusting in human beings? You know, mortal beings who cannot save you, who on that day, the spirit departs from their body, they return to the ground. Blessed are you who trust in the Lord, the God of Jacob, who keep your hope in the Lord. Indeed, he as the maker of heaven and earth is the sole place we should put our trust in. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we are grateful this morning for the gift of fellowship. Fellowship, albeit online, Lord, we thank you that you have enabled us to gather together to hear your word preached to us. So we ask that you shall start with us as we begin this service. We ask that Jehovah Lord, anyone and everyone who will be involved in this service shall be used of you. Speak to us in the way that you want and open our hearts, prepare our hearts to hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. I'll welcome uh, the music team to give us our first song this morning. Uh, you know, set us in the mood for the service with the song, Jesus, Thank You, Music Team. Jesus, 
beautiful way to start our service this morning. Jesus, thank you that your blood has washed away my sins. You know, the wrath of God fully satisfied. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like us to join in the words of our Lord's Prayer even as we go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Dear Lord, we are grateful this morning for the opportunity to gather, even if it's online, and get to once again be reminded of the good news of the gospel of Christ and of salvation. Thank you for your continued provision for us, even for the gift of technology that allows us this morning to gather together. We may indeed miss the fellowship, but we are grateful for, for channels such as this that remind us of what a good God we serve. Thank you, Lord, for Grace Point Church. Thank you that you continue to guide us and bless us abundantly. How we pray, Lord, that you will keep helping us to remain grounded in your word and keep the gospel central in all that we do. Thank you for our elders in this church. Thank you for Reverend Harrison, Pastor Fidel, Elder John Sekenyi, Peter Kamal, and Patrick Bundy. We pray that, Lord, you will continue pouring on them the dew of your blessing Grant them wisdom as they lead us, your people, in the way that we should go. We're grateful for the reminder to trust in you and you only. Thank you, Lord, for salvation and for the gift of your Son. 
We pray that we shall continue looking to the cross for our salvation. We pray for our country, Kenya, this morning, O Lord. We ask that even in this era of the pandemic, that you shall continue to show us mercy and that your will shall continue to prevail in our midst. We pray for our president, His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, his deputy, and all other leaders of our country, and ask that you will continue to grant them wisdom and guidance as they lead our country. Thank you, Lord, specifically for the people among us that have been in the front line against the battle on coronavirus. We pray for those of them among us, doctors, nurses, caregivers, community health workers, and all that are involved at, at, at this time. We ask that you shall continue to look after them and grant them your protection. We pray for those in our midst that have in one way or another been affected by this pandemic. How we ask that you shall continue to look down upon them with mercy and provide for all their needs in the only way you can. Thank you for this morning's service. Pray that we'll continue to see your will, your mercy, and your great love for us, even as we continue our sermon series on the desert experience and through the book of Deuteronomy this morning. We ask that you're going to use your servant, Elder Peter Kamau, even as he brings your word to us this morning. We pray for all that will be involved. The Lord, you shall use them as vessels to bring honor to your name. In Jesus' name. We pray and believe. Amen. It's time for a session that I love and hold dearly in my heart. Catechism. You know, just an affirmation of what we believe in and the truths that are uh, the gospel and what we believe in. We are at question number 27, which I believe is being projected on your screens at the moment. So I'll ask the question, and I'll request that we say the answer together. Question 27. Are all people, just as they were lost through Adam, saved through Christ? Are all people, just as they were lost through Adam, saved through Christ? The answer together, no, only those who are elected by God and united to Christ by faith. Nevertheless, God in his mercy demonstrates common grace even to those who are not elect by restraining the effects of sin and enabling works of culture for human well-being. If we could say that again, are all people just as they were lost through Adam, saved through Christ? Together. No, only those who are elected by God and united to Christ by faith. Nevertheless, God in his mercy demonstrates common grace who are not elect by restraining the effects of sin and enabling. What a powerful reminder this morning and, and what a privilege to be among the elect. But God continues to demonstrate his mercy to all, you know, common grace to all those who are not elect by restraining the effects of sin and enabling works of culture for human beings. Beautiful reminder. I'll encourage you to keep going through um, these questions at your own free time, in your homes and in your families. Keep reminding yourselves of this truth. Uh, it's time uh, for the children's slot, and uh, today teacher Ken will be teaching us. So adults, children, take your seats and enjoy the children's slot. Karibu, uh, teacher Ken. Hello children, welcome to our Sunday school lesson this morning. My name is Ken Irungu, and I'll be teaching us from the Bible this morning. Children. Let's keep praying that God will grant a cure and medicine for coronavirus so that soon we'll be able to meet here at church and we'll all be able to go to school.
Today, we continue learning from the Bible with our story today coming from Exodus chapter 32. Before we look at our story today, let's pray that God will help us hear and listen to his word this morning. God, we pray so much that you'd please speak to us this morning through your word. Please help us to listen to you and to hear what you have to tell us this morning through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we look at our Bible story today, we want to remind ourselves what we have covered so far. We have seen so far in the book of Exodus how God saved his people from slavery in Egypt and how he provided for them in the wilderness. We have also seen children, how God told his people that they are going to live, he's going to live with them. I hope you remember how we saw God giving the Israelites Ten Commandments so that they can know how they are to live as God's people. Last Sunday, we saw with teacher Eugene how God was going to live with the Israelites. Now, to test whether you remember the lesson, I have a quiz of three questions. In this quiz, children, I'm going to give you three multiple choice answers. Please quickly do tell the correct answer to your parents. Are you ready? Good. Question one. Why could the people not be near God? Why could the people not be, a, be near God? A, because the people are very many. B, because they do not want to come near God. C, because of their sin and God is very holy. What is the correct answer? Tell the correct answer to your mom or dad. The correct answer is C, because of their sin and God is holy. That's why they couldn't come near God. Question two, what needed to be built so God could live with his people? What needed to be built so that God could live with his people? A, a very big house. B, a big tent called a tabernacle. C, a big sheep. Tell the answer to your mom or dad. The answer is B, well done, a big tent called a tabernacle. Question three, how many parts or rooms were there in the tabernacle? How many parts or rooms were there in the tabernacle? A, three parts, B, one part, C, two parts. Tell the correct answer also to your parents. And the correct answer is A, three parts. Outer room, inner room, and innermost place or innermost room. I have a bonus question. From last week's Bible story and what we have learned, how does God dwell with us today? A, in a church. B, through Jesus Christ. It Christ in the spirit. C, through our parents. What is the correct answer? Tell that to your parents. And the correct answer is B, through Jesus in the spirit. So God lives through with us today through Jesus. Well done if you got all the answers. Please do tell your parents to buy you a chocolate for the good work. Now, let's continue with today's Bible story from Exodus chapter 32. But before we begin, children, I wonder if someone gives you a piece of paper, like this one, and then gives you a pencil and tells you to draw a photo of your best friend, will you, will you be able to draw it? Yes, I know you can be able to draw it. In fact, I did try to draw one, and this is the photo that I tried to draw that looks like this. Now, just imagine with me, children, someone tells you, gives you a piece of paper like this one, and also tells you to draw God. Can you be able to do that? Can you? Of course not. Why would you not be able to draw God? This is because no one has ever seen God and no one knows how God looks like. So we cannot be able to draw God. Now, in our Bible story today, 
We see the Israelites making a very big mistake. They made a very big sin by trying to make a copy. Or if you like, by trying to draw God. And this is what the Bible calls an idol of God. Now, this is today's Bible story. Moses was up in the mountain where God was giving him all the instructions that he was to give the people of Israel. And the people of Israel were at the foot of the mountain. But Moses took long up in the mountain. He stayed up there for 40 days. Now, just imagine children, your parents going away from you and leave you alone in the house for one day, two days, three days, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, imagine, for 40 days. How would you feel being left alone for 40 days? This is exactly how the Israelites felt. Looking at Exodus chapter 32, the Bible says in verse 1, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered round Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron told them to take all their gold earrings and all their braces, so like this one. So they had a lot of things that they brought to Aaron. And then after bringing everything to Aaron, Aaron made all those things and brought them together and from it made a golden calf. And then when the calf was made, they had a very big party to celebrate and worship this golden calf, worshiping it and calling it their God. Remember, where was Moses all this time? Moses was up in the mountain. Now, God told Moses in verse 7, go down from this mountain. Your people that you brought out of Egypt have done a terrible sin. What have they done? They have quickly turned away from the things that God had commanded them to do. They made for themselves a golden calf and they worshipped that calf and offered sacrifices to it. God was very angry with the children of Israel and he wanted to punish them. But Moses pleaded with God not to punish them. The good thing is, children, in verse 14, the Bible says, Then the Lord changed his mind. He did not destroy the people of Israel because Moses pleaded with God not to punish them. Moses then came down from the mountain with two stone tablets in his heart. These two stone tablets had the Ten Commandments. When Moses came close to the camp, he saw the gold calf and the people dancing. How do you think, children, Moses felt? Yes, he became very angry. He threw down the stone tablets which he was carrying. He broke them at the bottom of the mountain. Moses then took the calf that the people had made. He melted it in the fire. And then Moses separated those who truly wanted to worship the Lord and those who didn't. We are going to see next Sunday what happens next. But for now, we want to ask ourselves, children, what do we learn from our Bible story today? The first thing, children, that we learn is we should, we should not make the mistake the Israelites made of creating an image of God. Just as we said we cannot be able to draw God in a paper, we should not think we can be able to have our own small God whom we can see and touch. The children of Israel made a golden calf. But could the golden calf hear their prayers? Can it speak? Can it move? Can it provide for them in the wilderness? Can, it, can even this golden calf rescue them from trouble? The answer to all these questions is no. We thus should not make an image of all an idol of God. In fact, what we need to do is to pray and worship the God of the Bible, the way he tells us to worship him in the Bible. And how do we know this God of the Bible? We know the God of the Bible children through Jesus. 
This is the second thing we learned from our Bible story today, that God has shown himself and has made himself known to us through Jesus. Children, Jesus is the perfect revelation of God. When we know what Jesus is like, we know exactly what God is like. And how can we know Jesus? We know Jesus, children, from reading the Bible, as we have done this morning, and as we always do at home with our parents. We want to spend some time now praising God for who he is and that he has chosen to make himself known to us through Jesus when we believe in him and when we put our trust in him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you have made yourself known to us through Jesus. We pray that you'd please help us not to worship anything else that is not what you have told us to do in your word. We pray that you'd please forgive us for times when we have tried to make an image or an idol of you. Please help us to keep believing and trusting in Jesus. For these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, children, what we want to do today, we want to start learning a memory verse, which we'll be doing in the next few weeks. Our memory verse today is very simple, so I want us to see it as you can see it from the screen. And then what we're going to do is, I'm going to say it alone, and then you're going to repeat the memory verse after me. So our memory verse for this series, remember we are doing a journey to the promised land, will be from Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. And the memory verse is, not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. Can we read the memory verse together? Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. It says, Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. Let's say that again. Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. It says, Not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. At this moment, we want to do the craft, and today's craft is very simple. So today's craft looks like this. So your parents will give you a piece of paper that looks like this, that has a golden calf. Remember, that's what the Israelites made. And then in this golden calf, what you need to do is, you need to color it, and then fix a piece of uh, hard cardboard behind it, and then I want you to put some golden thing behind it. So you can use foil, or you can use a gift wrappers if you have that at home. Or even you can tell, ask your parents what they can give you to help put it behind it. And then at the front, you just need to color this with maybe golden colors or different colors. Or maybe even your favorite color. And then when you do that, your final craft will look something like this. So at the front, you'll have colored your the golden calf, and then at the back, you'll have put a foil or something that looks shiny or golden. And then one thing that you need to do, because this is a cow or a calf, I want you to put some peg on it so that it can be able to stand on the table or somewhere else. And then the good thing with the golden calf that we have, will make today has the lesson for today, which says that Israel learned that God is not a golden idol. So Israel, Israel learned that God is not a golden idol. So this is our craft for today. At this time, we want to sing a song. And the song reminds us that no one is good. We need someone to save us. And that someone is Jesus, who is a mighty, mighty savior. So let's sing this song together. I hope you're going to enjoy it.
Thank you very much, Teacher Ken, for such a wonderful lesson. And thank you, music team, for that powerful, powerful song. Children, I hope you remember what you have learned this morning. Two things that you should not worship anything else that is not God. And number two, that you should worship God through Jesus, who makes God known to us. And that the song this morning was just... Very lovely. Thank you very much, music team, for that song. What a mighty, mighty saviour Jesus is. Um, at this time, I want to call upon the music team to give us a number, even as we prepare our hearts to hear from the word of God. More about Jesus. And then our sister, Rehab Nyambura, will read uh, the scripture for us. Saving fullness in more. 
reading will come from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 26, um, the whole of the chapter. I read, when you have entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land that the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in office at the time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. The priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean and he went into Egypt to the few people and lived there and became a great nation powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians ill-treated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with, a great, with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us up to the place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow before him. The new and the Levites and the foreigners residing among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. When you are finished setting aside a tenth of all your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe, you shall give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Then say to the Lord your God, I have removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all you commanded. I have not turned aside from your commands, nor have I forgotten any of them. I have not eaten any of the sacred portion while I was in mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor have I offered it any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God. I have done everything you commanded me. Look down from heaven, your holy dwelling place, and, and bless your people Israel and the land and the land you have given us as you promised on oath to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have declared this day that the Lord your God is that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commands and laws, that you will listen to him. And the Lord has, has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all the nations he has made, and that you be a, holy, a people holy to the Lord, your God, as he promised. And that is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, uh, Rahab, for that uh, wonderful reading. Uh, good morning and praise the Lord. Uh, it's very good for us to be able to uh, be gathered, although it's online, as a church family, uh, to be able to hear God's word. My name is Peter Kamau, 
And I am born again, and I'm so much glad to be able to be preaching for us today. And we continue with our series in the book of Deuteronomy. And today we look at Deuteronomy 26. Can I encourage you to keep that particular passage opened as we are going to be looking at it in a short while. Now I would like to, to pray uh, so that we can be able to start. Almighty and everlasting God, you created everyone and everything in the world and heavens. All belongs to you. Indeed, everything is yours. And more than that, Lord, you have caused us to be born again, to be created again in Christ Jesus through that precious blood that was shed on the cross. And therefore, we are his, we are yours. And this morning, we pray that as we hear your word, Lord, please would you help us to listen with grandness and submission to it, mm -hmm. and to respond with obedience. And I too pray that as you bless your people this morning, please do not pass me by. Mm -hmm. All this is we pray in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now today we are wonderfully looking at a, an interesting topic of the fast fruits and the tithes. Um, uh, might be uh, something you either look forward to or maybe not, uh, but I pray that the Lord is going to be speaking to us as we hear his word. Now, what's your experience of giving time? Uh, maybe you come from a tradition where it takes a good mobilizer in a church, maybe an elder or one of the members of the church, to talk about giving. They, they speak about how God will bless you, how God will open uh, doors for you, uh, and they might even give one or two testimonies. Maybe there might be somebody who did give and they seem to have been blessed and therefore a good motivator for you to give. Or, on the other hand, you probably come from a background, I do not want to mention names, where giving is not given much attention. Uh, after all, you know, it's just a basket of offering, just going around, just throw what you have. You know, um, you know that's not the much. It almost sounds like the, the, the commercial break we find in the news. You know, uh, there is news to be read, and that's what we are interested in, but hey, they've got to pay bills. And sometimes it can feel that way in our giving. Now, the question I'm glad you're asking is, <laughs> Kamau, how should we give then? Um, how, how much should I even give? But can I say the best question I think is, why does giving even exist? Um, in fact, why did God even bring the whole idea of giving? Now, this is quite wide and even controversial topic, but what we have here is a foundational basis on how and why we should be able to give. I think you can almost think of what we get in Deuteronomy 26 as the 101 of giving. Now, I just need to flag this up, that I have used in this particular sermon the term giving in very generic form. Although in our passage today, it's very specific to fast fruits, and the fast fruits was that fast agricultural produce uh, of a season that was, was given. That's what they were supposed to take. Um, and the other one is tithes. In fact, the tithes we get here is not even the annual tithe. So we would have the 10% of your produce annually, but here, the tithe that I mentioned from verses 12 is a third year tithe, which was sort of cumulative, so a different tithe from the one that you would give year in, year out. But it's also good to notice that in the scriptures, there are so many different types of giving that are mentioned. And therefore, the reason for me to take that angle of just giving it a generic term. And also, I need to say that our passage will not answer all our questions about giving, but I think he's going to answer the most central question about giving. I pray that it's going to be an eye and a heart opening for all of us. Now, we are still at the praise of Moab, and Moses is giving these summons to this new generation of Israelites. And his biggest goal and concern is when they enter into the land that the Lord has promised, the land they have been looking forward to, the land of Canaan, the land we are told is flowing with milk and honey, when they enter into that particular land, how are they going to live? I guess if you remember your first day when you were leaving home to go to high school or to go to college, it's like that speech which your mom might have given you of who you are supposed to avoid when you get to that particular place. 
And the children of Israel are being given such kind of a speech as they look to the, across to the promised land that they are going to be. So how are you going to live and worship in the promised land? And our passage today, uh, and I'm going to, co uh, to concern myself so much to verses 1 to 15, gives us four things that are very central and basic to giving that I think will be very much eye-opening for us. So please, would you uh, walk with me as we go through that particular passage? So four things about giving that we are learning here in this particular passage. The first one is that giving is about God's provision. Giving is about God's provision. Now just look at verses 1. When you have entered the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and have taken possession of it and settled in it, in other words, Moses is, is very keen to stress that the land you are getting in is not the land that you have conquered other people. It's not the land that you, you have bought so much with money. It is the land that the Lord has given you. And verse 2, even as they take the produce, the first fruits, do notice there, again, it is the first fruits of all the produce from the soil of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You could almost summarize what Moses here is saying is that the land and the fruit all belongs to the Lord. And so the first thing that leader they are to acknowledge in their minds before they can even think about giving is that it is all provided by God. It all starts with God providing. Otherwise, by the way, even the question of giving does not exist if you don't have anything to give. And so as the Israelites family collected that basket of fast produce, Malimbuko kwa Kiswahili, to go to the sanctuary and worship God, one constant reminder that was supposed to be in their minds, in their hearts, in their mouths, was that God and no one else had provided both the land and the fruit. In fact, it is God and not the Baal. It is God and not any fertility God that we're going to encounter in that particular promised land. And giving was a testament that God indeed had given. And I think one of the interesting things you encounter as you go through that particular passage uh, in 26 is that it was not just a testament that God had provided for them alone, but it was also a testament and a way in which God was providing for others. An example that we find in verses 11, it was not just to them, but as they gave... As I gave the first fruits, God was providing, verse 11, to the Levites and the foreigners. And as we get to the tithing uh, in verses 12, we find the list even expanded. It is the Levite, it is the foreigner, it is the fatherless, it is the widow. Did you see what happens there? That the God, the way God was organizing these particular communities, in the end, everybody was provided for by God. And that principle is the same even as we get to the New Testament. For we see uh, that principle among the believers as they give generously, that that is a way and a means in which God provides for the needy. We hear that description of the early church from the book of Acts, that they gave generously so that there was no poor among them. But interestingly, it's not just that this is the evidence that God has given, it is also the evidence that God will provide in future. In other words, giving pointed to God's provision in the past, but also in the future. You provided, as you said, and you trusted the Lord, that look, he will provide. So the first fruit, the idea of the first fruit is you are still yet to harvest. So this is just, mahindi mianza kukuriwa kidogo kidogo na nyuni. But what you are saying is, I trust God, not just for these five maize cups, but actually I trust the Lord that even the whole land I am going to harvest. And no wonder they make that, that prayer uh, in verses 15. That God look down from heaven, your holy dwelling place, and bless your people Israel and the land that you have given us. It is God will continue to provide even next month and the month after. Now, this is very critical for us. And I that you and I need to remember that before we can even think about giving, that it is God who provides, both little and plenty. For we have a tendency to give that glory or that credit to ourselves or others or our tactics or resilience. 
And particularly even more when you think of yourself as a breadwinner. We like to call ourselves that way. Or even if you're the one who normally helps people who may be needy in your family or your siblings, that temptation easily creeps in to think, oh, I am the one who provides. Now we need this. It is the Lord who provides. Now, a friend of mine told me a story that in the developed countries, I hope you know that ours is developing, uh, children will be taken mostly to animal farms to learn basic things like where does milk come from? And the reason they have to be told that way is because they grow up thinking milk comes from a fridge. And they have to be told, no, 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 milk doesn't come from a fridge. Actually, it comes from an animal called a cow. Now, giving is almost <laughs> like going back to that farm and be told, look, who actually provides? It is God who provides for us, nothing else. But the second thing that we see here, as much as we're talking about the topic of giving, is that giving was about God's faithfulness. It was about God's faithfulness. Now, one of the things you'll notice there as you go through the text is that it almost looks like the liturgy or a process of giving in a sanctuary. So the person who was carrying the basket of, of fruits was supposed to go, and they were supposed to be declaring some things. And here is the first declaration that we find in verses 3. So they go to the priest in that particular time, the place where God has chosen, and what are they to say, verses 3? I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land that the Lord saw to our ancestors to give to us. Look at that. I'm declaring today that I have arrived in the land that God had promised my forefathers. You go back all the way to Genesis, and you remember when God met Abraham. He promised him, among other things, the land of Canaan. That land uh, flowing with milk and honey is sort of the image of productive land. And as Israel harvested that first produce, that first fruits, and carried it to the sanctuary, it was meant to remind them God had kept his promise. It was sort of a personal declaration that I, the Israelites who was given that time, I have arrived at what God promised to my forefathers. In other words, you could almost think of that particular basket of fast fruits as a basket of God's faithfulness. That after many years, many generations had passed, they, that generation could say, we have seen God's promises being fulfilled in our time. But the other thing that we find here that is very interesting about giving is that it was about God's work of salvation. Look with me in verses 5 to 10. This is a second declaration that the person who brought the first fruits were to make. And what we find here in verses 5 to 10 is almost a recap of the history of the children of Israel being able to bring about the deliverance so that now they find themselves in the promised land. In fact, look at those verses with me. Verse 5. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God. What are you to declare? My father was a wandering animal, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians ill-treated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm with great terror and with signs and wonders. He brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Look at that. They, 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 they recount their story. They recap their story all the way going back to Jacob. He was the, the wandering and a man. I think that's why he got his two wives, Leah and Lecho. He was sort of, that's what almost Jacob was. He was almost perishing, others would say. And I think as they said that, the highlight of the point is, I am only here, settled in my own land, and not wandering like Jacob, my father, because God has done it for me. And you see what they say again there? He was wandering, and he also lived as an alien, sort of a sojourner there. He was a foreigner in Egypt, which is a huge contrast that the person who is now speaking is no longer a foreigner. He is now a native. In fact, he can say, That's the whole point we have here. 
He now has his own land. In fact, the evidence of it is a basket of the fruit that he is carrying. They were few in number. The Lord made them to be mighty. They were mistreated. We remember back in the story of Exodus. They were being mistreated and enslaved. They were forced to build the cities for Pharaoh. What happened to them? They cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, the, the God of the covenant, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He heard and he saw. What did he do? He brought them out by this prey of great might. The, the pricks, the death of firstborn, the parting of the Red Sea, the provision of manna and quail in the wilderness. By the way, at this particular time, they are still eating manna and quail. And he brought them out of the land and gave them the land that is fertile. And now, here is a sample. Can you see that? That he was supposed to sort of remind them almost their salvation's testimony. So well planned that it would remind them of their own deliverance, that picture. That look, you are almost nothing, but the Lord, God, has made you now to be settled in your own place. You can picture a typical family, maybe a uh, Joshua's family. And they are there with their uh, nine, nine sons and nine daughters. And they are there presenting that basket of fast foods. And as they recite, as they declare this, even the youngest ones, who was not there even in the wilderness, can be reminded that the Lord rescued you. Now some of you are more, almost wondering, have we drifted away from giving? I was expecting a number. No, actually we are at the heart of it. Because you see, God planned that giving time was supposed to be a testimony time for them. It was the testimony that God had delivered them, that God had saved them, that God had given them a land. And the story is not different to the new covenant. For at the heart of giving is our salvation. It's what God has done to us. In fact, we read these words from Paul exhorting the church in Corinth to be able to give to the poor saints and the needy saints in Jerusalem. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, Paul says this one, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. How did Jesus become poor? Of course, Paul is not talking about poverty of money, but lowliness of Christ becoming like us and dying on the cross so that we might become like him, the sons of God. But Paul says, that's the motivation for you to give to the saints in Jerusalem. Which is very interesting. That that testimony is meant as they remember what Christ has done to them, what Christ has made them to be. For he has given them riches that cannot be quantified by silver. And as they remember that, that becomes a motivation to be able to give. In fact, we can almost say that testimony, that declaration of the children of Israel, to be our own testimony. Maybe it's ours, it's almost worse, for we were lost and dead. In fact, we didn't cry out to him like the Israelites, for we didn't even know who to cry to. But he reached to us. He resurrected us from the dead, as we hear Paul talking in Ephesians. And now we are his possession, his own people. Everything that we are and have is his. We are nothing without him. We have everything in him. I think like clothes uh, that we normally like to buy, like the one that I'm wearing, with always tags, believers have a tag by God and for God. It's, it's almost like giving time was supposed to be a rehearsing time for the gospel, for what God has done to them. I can imagine if, if we try to practice that in our day, as we, we thought about what God has done in us, that as we prepared to enter that pay bill or to throw that, that coin or that note in the offering basket, we remember that God has given his only son for us. How wonderful that would be. And why is it this important? Well, because they would easily forget about their own salvation, is it? They would make it a religious issue. Giving would become just a thing of marking, pointing and, and saying, I have done it. They would forget that it is God who gives you see, harvesting will become so natural, year in, year out, that they will tend to forget this is just natural happenings. Don't we do that to ourselves today? We think, oh yeah, earning, getting money is just so natural. Everybody just gets it. What's so big about Why are you making a big thing about it? 
I guess that would change our thinking, is it? To actually focus and see it's all about God. It's all about what he has done for us. It's the most important thing that has happened to our lives. In fact, the most important thing is not that at the end of the month we have earned. It is that at the end of the month we still belong to our God. And giving was meant to remind them about that. And the last point really, that you're going to be getting here is that giving was about obeying the Lord. It was about obeying the Lord. Now, so far we looked at that particular portion from verses 1 to 11 that is measuring on the first fruits. And as we turn to verses 12, all the way to 15, we find another type of giving that we're supposed to be making, which was called uh, the third year tithe. It's slightly different from the annual tithe that we're supposed to be making. And if you want to read more, you could go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 14 that talks about the annual tithing. And we are told that one of the things they were supposed to be doing is that they were supposed to be giving a, a, a tithe in the third year. And this tithe was supposed to be given to the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows in the towns, now not in the sanctuary as before, so that those people can also be fed and satisfied. But And here is that declaration that we are going to be reading in a short while. But the big thing here, and so far in Deuteronomy, has been the emphasis on obeying the Lord. In fact, Moses almost keeps on calling them, obey the Lord, don't be like your forefathers who lie dead now in the wilderness. The call is obey and live. But look at what the man has to say or the woman after they have given their tithe. The, that declaration that we find there in verses 13 and 14. He will say what? Then he will say, after giving the tithe, I have removed from my house the sacred portion and have given it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, the widow, according to all you commanded. I have not turned aside from your commands, nor have I forgotten any of them. I have not eaten any of the sacred portion while I was mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor have I offered any of it to the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God. I have done everything you commanded me. What a declaration. You see, the, the, they were declaring to begin with that I have come to the land. God, you have been faithful. They were also declaring, look, I was almost nobody. My father was wandering, and now you rescued me. And now the third declaration here is, God, I have obeyed you. Remember, again, who we are talking about. They are at the border, almost to get into the promised land. And that land they are going to occupy is filled with other nations whom they have been told to drive out. And do not, one of the things they are told is to destroy their places of worship. They are not to adapt their ways of worship. And throughout what we find is God is very specific, as we also saw in the book of Leviticus, on how he is to be worshipped. It's not just any way that we wake up and think about it. And the way to obey God is to do things in his own terms. You worship God in his own terms, not on your own terms. And in this particular case, it was the obedience that was to be seen in their giving of the first fruits and the tithes. Of course, we are very advantaged today as we stand here to have the complete uh, uh, scriptures with us. Because we do know later on that they did not fully obey them. In fact, uh, next week when we be looking at the curses and the blessings, it will become very clear to us that it's not that much easy. In fact, they do not obey God in the future. In fact, later on in life, what we hear, we hear uh, cases of them when they were offering weak, sick, and dying animals to God. They made it religious, you see. It's, they, made it, they, they moved God from, from the idea of giving and made it themselves so that it was just about, oh, it's again time to give. Let me just give this weak animal and just tick the box. Or the case we get in Malachi where they have just neglected the whole idea of giving. They lost it. And we too always get it wrong. We easily drift to one or the other. We drift to making giving about being about me, about being about other stuff and not about God. And the call to obedience is, is not different for us. In fact, Jesus Christ himself does call us to obey. The, the good thing about in the new covenant with the coming of Jesus Christ is that our call to obedience is not just a mere effort by me and you. 
But in Christ, we have his spirit that do help us to obey. But beware. For as Jesus Christ cautioned the Pharisees, there is always a tendency to divide the things I'm going to obey and the things I'm not going to obey. In fact, this is how Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in the book of Luke 11 and 42. Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and loo and every herb. They were very good tithers, by the way. And they neglect justice and the love of God. And Jesus says to them, this you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You see, the, the call for us to obey God is an ever clear call for us even in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus says that they will know that you are my disciples if you obey my commandments. And it cannot be overemphasized, is it, that obedience to God is the yardstick for maturity in discipleship. And that includes, even for us in the New Testament, generosity in our giving. Although we don't have in the New Testament that explicit percentage of giving, nevertheless, the requirement to give, the command to give, is one that is very, very much clear. And I do need to mention there a little bit because that can be a bit contentious there. Oh, are we to give 10? I think actually in the New Testament, we should give 100. 10 is just but a bare minimum if you should give. And the response of, of, of the redeemed, you see, is not just simply that I'm going to tick the box of a 10th mark. I'm going to try and count very well to give 10. No, 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 no. We are those who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ given more than we deserve, we are to trust and graciously, generously to be able to give. We are to, to share with others because we have been given. Because we have received, as someone, as the scripture says, that to more that is given more than is expected. And the thing that we find there is quite a beautiful thing as this particular person who is given now ends in verses 15 by praying that the Lord will continue to bless and sustain him for what he had done. Look down from heaven, he says, your holy dwelling place, and bless your people Israel and the land you have given us as you promised on oath to our ancestors, a land flowing with milk and with honey. You see, like we, we, we said in the first point there that it's about God provision, it's not just we, we give in because he has given, it's also that we are trusting him, you see, that God will continue to give. The thing about giving is, it is letting go because we trust God who will sustain us even for tomorrow. Why do people hold, by the way? We always hold, like people are holding goods during this corona period, because we think there will be no. You know, there will be no one to be found. Let me buy all the sanitizers in the supermarkets because tomorrow there wouldn't be any. And as we give, one of the things we are saying is, look, I can let go because God, who has provided that which I'm actually holding, will provide for me even going forward. But sometimes we behave like those little children. If you ever have your nephew or your child and you take them to the shop and you buy a lollipop or some cakes, just try and ask them to give you a bit of it. They always don't want to give. They almost don't trust you. I think that's a message. But you don't want to get that. Uh, children, I hope you are closing your ears. But as we give, it's a testament for that. But can I say something else that is very interesting that I found out is giving is the antidote for coveting. So coveting said, I want to get something that belongs to the other person. But giving releases us because we trust in God. And what we have to be aware of is a kind of a mean centered around things. Now, as we wrap this up, do we rejoice in God who has given to us, or do we think it is ourselves who have actually done it? Do we rejoice that actually God has provided for us? In fact, as we receive that paycheck, or as that SMS hits our phone or our account, do we, do we actually praise the Lord that you have provided, or do we think, by my own strength, I have done it? But also, practically, we tend to, to drift from the main thing, which is worship with our giving, and we tend to think, oh yeah, this is just a mere religious thing that I'm going to do. We challenge to give generously, you see, in the New Testament, uh, and in your own volition. But be aware, and I should say this, that just generosity calling is not an easy thing to do, which is why uh, it's good to encourage yourself to have a discipline about it. 
it's not just going to be waking up generously and just deciding which coin comes out first in my pocket. I think as Paul says there in 2 Corinthians 9, that each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compassion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And the last thing, God is trustworthy to provide for our needs. As we offer, as we give, as we celebrate what God has done, God will continue to bless and to provide for us. Indeed, if you have to think about the summary of this is, God has provided for us. God is the center of our giving. Let me pray. Lord, what do we have that you have not given to us? In fact, our very own lives belong to you. Body and soul and everything that you have given to us is all yours. And yet, Lord, we those who constantly take you out of the picture and place ourselves in the middle of giving, Lord, would you forgive us and help us that we'll be able to worship you with our giving as we take care of those you have given us around us, the needy ones, the Levites, the widows, and the orphans. So, Lord, please, would you help us, Lord, to continue being generous, even so, Lord, as we rejoice in what you have provided for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a powerful reminder this morning. Thank you so much, Elder Peter Kamau, for bringing us the word ever so clearly this morning and reminding us that indeed God is trustworthy to provide. He will provide for us. And so we should worship him with our giving. Could you just take a minute this morning to just let that sink in? And that get inscribed into the tablets of our hearts. Just take a minute to go before the Lord.
indeed that prayer is a wonderful prayer to make that the Lord will take our all the Lord will take our everything to be his that our hearts will be always his and indeed God's people those of us who have been saved we belong to the Lord we don't belong to ourselves we belong to the Lord it has been said that the last place to be converted is our pockets but brothers and sisters, I hope we have been converted in totality. All we are, all we have, belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, everyone, for being part of our service this morning. Uh, we are so glad that you could join us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the coming Sunday. But just a reminder, um, we, we are still not um, having physical gatherings. We still await the directives from the government, but uh, again, the elders will be providing direction in the coming days. Uh, also to say that uh, from last week, we have begun our midweek Bible study. So every Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m., we have our midweek study. And we, we are studying through the book of Lamentations. Uh, Lamentations, uh, this, this is an exciting book. I welcome you to join us again uh, next Wednesday from 8 to 9 p.m. as we study through the book of Lamentations. And, and also just to say that, um, you know, if there's anything you would love to be addressed, if, if there's any need you have, please feel free to contact the elders or um, just get in, get in touch uh, to, with, with the church office and we'll be able to assist you where we can. Thank you so much, Lord's people, uh, for your generosity. Uh, we acknowledge the way you have continually given your time, your resources, and we thank God for that. Uh, let me finish by reminding us of who we are. These are the words from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. The Apostle Peter writing says this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. Let's share the words of grace together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.